Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today on What We've Been Playing, I'm joined by my co-host, Corinne, the Super Blonde Nerd. How are you doing, Corinne? I'm so good, Mackenzie. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. It's been a great week so far, and I'm so excited to talk about games, particularly some of the games that you said that you were excited to play for this upcoming week, and it seems like you got them played, so I'm really excited to hear how they were. So, Corinne, do you want to start us off with your first game? Sure. So um, we're going to be starting with the one that I actually talked about, um, not the one on the thumbnail, which is the Night Cage. So the Night Cage is, um, I saw it at Barnes and Noble and I was like, ooh, a new spooky game for spooky season coming up. And it is a labyrinth cooperative survival game, I would say. So you are a, you start in a in a corner, you wake up and all you have is a candle, and you are exploring through this uh, through this labyrinth, and you basically are setting out tiles for each uh, turn, and the paths. There's a bunch of different paths that could be revealed on your tile. There also could be monsters that are revealed on your tile, um, and depending on what paths that you pull up is shows how many next tiles next to it adjacent to your paths will be lit up by your candle so it's just like lit up by one tile adjacent and only orthogonally um if you light up and you uh you have pulled out a monster the monster will not immediately attack it only attacks by movement um so there is some really kind of like suspense aspects to it your goal is everyone must get one skull key and then we all must converge on the same gate to exit the labyrinth together. If anyone dies, dies. If anyone loses a key, doesn't have a key, um, if anyone doesn't have a key, can't make it to the gate by the time that we kind of run out of uh, tiles, because you can run out of tiles and you most likely will get close to running out of tiles, depending on how many people are playing, you lose. There's a lot of like different ways you can lose. There's also a advanced version of this game. So the original part of the game, you only have one type of monster, which is the wax eater. And then in the advanced version of games, there are like four or five different monsters. And so that just adds more elements. So it's cooperative. You guys can talk to each other about where you're starting, which, path what side of the tile you should add your path onto you can exchange uh you can you basically can hold a candle and a key if someone can't get to a key you can give them your key if you land on another key tile kind of thing looks like they have an app which is cool um yeah there is just it's a lot the the full aesthetic is definitely spooky they've done a great job with the artwork and just like the full elements of a game, you could really play this on dark, dark night with just candles and really be immersed <laughs> into the, I think there's also a soundtrack you can download or like play off of Spotify and all that stuff was just, just super fun and super immersive to it. So I very much have been enjoying learning this game so far. I love stuff like that, where the thematics are present everywhere, including the soundtrack. Uh, Mythic Mischief recently has a soundtrack for it, and then Sleeping Gods killed it with their soundtrack. Amazing. I'm curious, for Night Cage, it seems like it follows a lot of the fare of a lot of maybe cooperative games that many people are familiar with. What's something that Night Cage does that's special or makes it very different in the gameplay? Hmm. <laughs> um, there is... Well, I don't know about like labyrinth games, like mm -hmm. how a lot of those go, but like you can see on the board there, there's an open ended bit to the grid. So if you have an end piece tile and you have, and it's, let's say it's lit up on the side of the end of your labyrinth, it will affect the top tile piece because everything's connected. If oh, that makes, interesting. If that makes sense. So it's like a big hallway, essentially? Basically, yeah. Oh, and it's, cool. And it's just kind of like a, what is it, like an optical illusion where it's like never ending kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's connected, and that's the same thing with monsters. If there is a tile to connect, um, if there's like a tile on the top and tile on the bottom, and you move and you're attacked by a monster, that monster will go through that tile onto the next tile because it's all connected. And like the labyrinth is ever changing. Um, so once you are un once you move from a specific place, 
the places that are not lit or are in like a one tile proximity, those go away. And then you mm -hmm. don't get those tiles back. So you have oh, limited. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. you have limited, um, limited, limited amount of tiles, like I was saying. So, and it's really, if you saw back on the thematic kind of aspect of it, there's a big cardboard candle that holds all the tiles. So you're eventually, you're basically seeing the candle like slowly, the light's gonna go out, and that's not good for your players. That's so fun. Yeah. So I love the thematics there with that candlelight being that stack of tiles. Super fun. I like mm -hmm. how they in, in, integrated that. But I also really enjoy the whole idea that you, it's so dark that when you leave a place, it gets dark again. That's that, that makes so much sense. It's really cool. Now, yeah. can you re go back to areas that you had just left just to play more tiles? Or is that probably not a good idea because the enemies are going to be around there? You can go back to a place that you've been before. Um, and yeah, it just, it depends on what you pull mm -hmm. on the tiles. So it could be, you could head back. Cause like I said, the labyrinth is ever changing. So if you head back, you could find a key or you could find a monster or you could just find another path. Um, so it's just the randomness. And that's like the, the, I guess, less strategic part is that you're definitely, uh, subjected to the luck of the drawing the tiles. So. Um, if you stay a per like you, the other option is so you can move constantly or you can stay and use a a nerve and everyone gets one nerve at the beginning. You can only have a maximum of two nerves and you can use those nerves to either stay put so you don't have to move and keep whatever you want lit uh, a light for at least another turn, as well as you can use your nerve to uh, attack the monster and take on um, just get it over with basically so there's there's definitely different aspects of your turn it's not just oh i'm moving around like there are different aspects of the uh gameplay excellent yeah. anything else to add on to the night cage someone was definitely in a dark place when they made this <laughs> <laughs> but i'm but yeah it's 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 very good it's a good it's very creepy it's it's all of the spookiness. So definitely recommend if you like spooky games. Gotcha. Good recommendation. So did it live up to your expectations when you saw it at the store? It did. Yeah, Good. I was, I mean, I, it was definitely, I don't know, not exactly what I was expecting, but it was really, it was really cool. Excellent. Perfect. So that is the Night Cage, our first game. And that brings us to our second game here. This is one that's been receiving a lot of buzz. One of the games that was super hot to get while you're at Gen Con. And this mm -hmm. is Cat in the Box. So that one is on the thumbnail there. So Cat in the Box. And this is a trick-taking game that really benefits if you already know how to play a trick-taking game. But have no fear. You can definitely run through some practice games before you get in. But the thing that makes this game different is that normally in a trick-taking game, you're playing colored suits and those suits are going to allow you to hopefully win tricks if you play the highest number then you win if you play out of suit though it's a way to get rid of maybe suboptimal cards and for future hands but there is a trump suit that's going to allow you to win automatically if you have the highest trump that's played so the twist here is that all of the cards in cat in the box are completely blank they're all this black color and anytime you play a card you immediately decide what color it is at that moment this is such a fascinating concept because your your brain automatically thinks wow i have so many options how does this a thing the way that it's tracked is actually very smart there is this little board here on the bottom that you can see each player is going to get one of these and the way it works is you start with all of these counters around it and every time you play a card as long as you are following the rules you've played something legal then you you track it on this main board as well as this mini board. Let's, I think an example would probably make more sense. Let's say that it's my turn and I play a, a six from my hand. And I say that this six is blue. I'm gonna take one of my little markers and put it in this central board. And then you'll cover up that six blue spot. And now that means that nobody else can possibly have the six blue because I've already played it. And then the next person will go in a normal trick taking game. If you have a card of the same color in your hand, you have to play it. And so obviously you can make any card, whatever you want. So you can play whatever card you want and say, yeah, it's blue. And then put your marker on whatever number you say in the blue row. However, you can also say, I don't have any blues. And when you don't have any blues, that means you can play anything. So that means that on your little card, that little square one with the X's, you remove the token off of the X for blue because now you don't have any blues. You've claimed that you don't have any. 
So for the rest of the entire round, you can't play blues. And it's going to go like that because you have to not only fit your hand appropriately, but you also have to play cards in legal placements. And the more that you claim that you don't have a specific color, that might be good for setting you up for potentially winning tricks in the future, but it also is going to narrow your options later. And that's a really cool aspect of the game is you're going to score points for two main ways. First way for every trick you get, you get a point, which is great. But you also are going to bid on how many tricks you win. And if you are correct on your bid, you're actually going to score points based on these markers that you have in that central area. And so the markers, once again, you'll place them on here if you decide to claim a trick of this, if you claim that a card is a specific color. So if I play the blue five, I'm going to put my little marker on the blue five section. If you successfully get your bid correct, you score points based on your biggest group of touching pieces on the central board. So when you play, you're not only thinking about potentially winning tricks, but also strategic placement. So there's actually area control in this game on where you're placing your cards. Mm -hmm. And this leads to a really interesting concept when it comes to changing up the game. The variance is there are actually tiles on this board. The board is actually made up of cards. And every time you play, you can actually take out the cards and flip them around to get different layouts of where the numbers are in this area control. It also makes it so that there are some suits that only have a certain amount of numbers. For example, one of the, the layouts we played, the red suit only had four numbers in it, but there were six uh, potentially for all the other ones, which was kind of crazy because if you... Um, for example, if you claim that you didn't have a specific color that had so many cards in it, you were setting yourself up to potentially paradox. And that's the last thing that I haven't mentioned about this game is if you ever get to a point where what you've claimed and what you have in your hand don't match and you can't play a card, you cause a paradox because you've put yourself in a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. And when a paradox happens, whoever causes the paradox immediately ends the round. So no one even finishes the trick, which is terrible because it happens all the time where a paradox happens and person's about to win the trick and that's going to put them at their bid. But then the paradox happens. They don't finish it. It's super frustrating. Love it. But the also, if for each trick you win, if you cause the paradox, you lose a point instead of getting a point for each trick. So it is terrible to be the person that does it. And yeah. that's not even the end of the paradox because the way it works is the game here sets you up so that there are a certain amount of each card in the deck. There are five of each card. So if you're playing in the regular mode, there's only four suits. So somebody could potentially get all of a specific suit, which is pushing you towards a paradox. And I think that is hilarious. So I that actually brings me to my question here is what games really set you up for, what games set you up for catastrophe or really awesome moments because i think that in this case the paradox can be a really awesome moment what do you think corinne yeah i'm thinking about uh i think tapestry is one of the first things that comes okay. to mind um depending on like how you are setting up your your tapestry cards for the benefits that you get as well as you have the luck of rolling uh, science, the science die. And if you land, if you wanted to move up in a certain, uh, I can't think of the words, the, like the certain areas and mm -hmm, move up tracks. one, uh, you could roll the one that you didn't want to move up on because usually on the science <laughs> track, the first couple of rolls that you do, you don't get the benefit of mm -hmm. whatever track you move up on. And so then you're like, oh, perfect. Wasted that move. Because you can choose not to move up on that track, mm -hmm. but you're also just not, you, you basically ruined that move for yourself because you wanted to move up on a certain track, but you got the one that you didn't want to move up on. So that, that's a little bit of setup. It's not a catastrophe, but it's definitely <laughs> not a good thing. I'm, I'm thinking more, but you go ahead and give an example. So yeah. this, is, this is the example I'm going to run oh, with because okay. I think that it's really smart. The idea that they've constructed the deck of cards to have exactly five of each. And mm -hmm. if you're playing with those modified card sets, you're going to have even less options to actually play those cards. And I think that adds for some really great choices, particularly if we're going for lower bets. And mm -hmm. you get to see your whole hand of cards at the beginning. So you can even make predictions 
questions as to who you think is going to cause the paradox if you're playing on one of those smaller areas. Because if you do play in the smaller, it's probably going to happen. The other way that the round can end is if everybody plays all but one card. But usually that's not the case. And so I really enjoy that whole concept of figuring out how you can push somebody into a situation where they paradox before you. There have been turns where somebody will purposefully lose a trick in Cat in the Box just so they don't have to start the next round so that they're last to play a card so that the person right before them will actually cause the paradox instead of them. Love the choices in this one. I think that the area control is smart. My only ding on this game is um, as you play the original version of the game, there seems to be some patterns that recur. There are some strong plays with being last because you can strategically always claim if you're last to play the trump suit if nobody else has or um, that might give you some freedom and creativity to claim the same number or do some sloughing. I think that winning tricks is a lot better than trying to go for the mm-hmm. area control, mm-hmm. just in general. Uh, that's what we've found by playing this game quite a bit. We've played four times on the normal maps and then two times on the uh, changed maps, so the ones that Ooh. have the different numbers. Cool. The ch- different number ones, though, I really appreciate because they do change up the strategy because the trump suit has less numbers. So if you're the first person to play towards the Trump suit, you're losing all of the slots in the color that you're choosing not to play on. Mm. Um, for example, the green has all six numbers in it. So if you decide, if somebody leads with green and you want to win the trick and you to say you don't have any greens left, you've lost access to all those greens, which means those other players have all of the greens available to play. Right. It's, it's a really interesting choice, and I think that's pretty good. So I yeah. think my preferred way to play is with the variant maps. I think that the shifted area control is interesting, and then the more pressure on the paradox is something I enjoy. So that'd be my recommendation nice. if you are going to try this one. The color picking also makes me think of Uno. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you can, you know, choose a wild, and that's mm-hmm. also kind of a setup for Catastrophe and Awesome if you have, like, a great deck of, like, reverse and skip and all that stuff so you could really be screwed over by (laughs) uno one of the smartest things this game does is with the orientation of the cards Mm -hmm. you can see this player board here you've got all the counters on the spots where you reveal them if you decide you don't have any of that Mm -hmm. specific color you've got the bid in the center as well so you put your tokens on there and then the last thing is you've got the colors on the four sides so when you play a card you place it onto one of those to indicate which color it's currently and i think that's really nice it's a really elegant way of doing it and it's really clear and people can see exactly what you've played so i think it's really good for tracking all that information the game does a lot to make sure that it's easily accessible and readable so i really like that that's awesome there's some good stuff here. Any other questions on Cat in the Box before we move on? What's the uh, player range? The player range is from two to four, I believe. Okay. Uh, I might be wrong. I think it might be five, actually. So two to five or two to four. Okay. Yeah, two to five, I think. Two to five. Uh, cool. The board changes it depending on the player count. There's mm-hmm. going to be less cards. There's like a little indicator on it that says use this in a five player game. Yep, five players up to five. Yeah. Uh, the gameplay does change based on those player counts because you are going to modify that board, which means there's more cards, but more players. Right. So it, it definitely evens out. Very cool. Um, so far, I really enjoyed it at three and four. I haven't played two or five yet. Yeah. Good stuff. So that yeah. is Cat in the Box, our second game here. And Corinne, what other game have you been playing? Uh, the one that has was on the th- the one that was on the thumbnail, which is the Search for Planet X. And I had no idea what this game was until we played it. And it is basically Clue with sci-fi flair. And now it's not exactly like Clue. There is a lot of guessing and research and intrigue. And it also comes with um, app use, which is, uh, at least with how my siblings and I played it. So you download the app and you can we just passed around one phone everyone could do their own on their own phone if they wanted to but you are specific you know you choose your specific player so each of us are represented by uh, a season and also like a telescope and you can choose different actions and what you're doing is trying to find planet x and there is a circular grid and there is a limitation to where you can look. So if you see there, the numbers that are revealed, sectors 10 through 18 is the places that you can look for. And you're trying to discover where Planet X is. But in order to find where Planet X is, you have to also cross out 
what's in the other sectors. So you can find asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, or empty sectors. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. There are also, I don't know if it would be, it's not bids, there are theories in this game, where if you're pretty certain about what's in what sector, as you see by those colored squares, you can place them in those sectors and you hide them by a little like data folder. But you can guess if it's a dwarf planet, a comet, or a asteroid, or a couple of other things. And if you get that correct, um, you will get extra points um, that will go towards your end scoring. As you can see there, everyone gets a little school divider, so you can't cheat off each other. <laughs> um, there's research. So again, on the app, you choose what you're researching, and each game is different. Uh, you have a list of like A through F, and so each letter represents a different uh, search category. So asteroids and dwarf planets, dwarf planets and gas clouds, all of those different things. And we were pretty like just open and said the whole thing, but you could just say, I'm researching A and everyone will know what A is because you're writing it down. You write it down at the beginning of the game. So everyone knows what each research topic is as well as you can survey. And when you survey, you can shoot, that's kind of you investigating and kind of giving clues to other people what you're investigating. Cause then, so let's say I am searching and I'm pretty certain where gas clouds are but I wanna make sure that I'm not missing anything. So I'm like, I'm gonna survey sectors two through seven for gas clouds. And like throughout the game, you're gonna be able to figure out whether or not there is a gas cloud there or not. Or if I keep searching that section for gas clouds, either there is one there or none, you know, none are there. And it's just kind of intuition, figuring out what other people are doing based on their research as well as what you are given. And usually you're given facts at the beginning. We play beginner mode. There's, uh, I think, beginner, medium, hard, expert. There's also two different sides of this board, which has, I think, uh, 12 sectors on one side and then like 18 sectors on the other. And that just determines how hard the game is. There's just more, hello, puppers. Um, more just more things to like combat with finding planet X. So I thought this was a really cool and interesting take on the idea of like clue and problem solving and intuition and all that stuff with uh, other players on the game. I hope that made sense. <laughs> <laughs> it does make sense. Um, deduction games like this, I have not played a lot that I've been super thrilled with. Mm. Uh, this one seems very interesting. How does the app integration work with this? Is this something that you like? Would you prefer it not be there? What do you think? I think there is a level of the app actually is helpful. It also fits very well with the kind of theme of the game which is more technology mm -hmm. because there are so many variations of how this game could go um you when each person gets the phone or if you use your own phone i don't know if that would be better if everyone used their own phone because then it's kind of like okay well everyone's on their phone you know or just passing it around and you you are like given just your information and then you click finish mm you know, you write down your information, click finish, and then you just pass it on to the next person. So there's that level of like secrecy. And I'm just trying to think how that would work with cards. Cause that would just be, you would only have, I guess, less variation in the game. I feel like if you are picking specific cards, because you know, if there's 12 sectors and then you're trying different games, there's like eight different variations per sector times 12 you know <laughs> so i think the app does help in that sense uh just for uh the amount of variation you can have in each game so it's not like oh it's this game mm -hmm. so i think that was helpful and again i i enjoyed us just passing around the the phone but i'm not sure how i'm, I'm still on the like fence about app integration with <laughs> I'm so sorry. I offended your dog. <laughs> he's talked about app integration. She and lost he's like, it. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm still on the fence about like app integration. I mean, I think it's only inevitable because technology and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it is probably helpful in certain things like Gloomhaven. We use the app and that is, that was really nice for us or the uh, website. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think it just depends on, in my opinion, hot take. <laughs> yeah, but I think overall. And then there's um, the, what is it? The, ob- the, the different telescopes, basically, that you're using. Ah. If you, there's a certain, everything has a cost of time. So depending okay. on what your you what action you choose to do, you will move your telescope around the rim a certain amount of times. And the way that it works is if you are in the front, you're going last. And so depending on what actions you choose, you might not get a turn mm. for like five to seven turns, depending on I that. like mechanisms like that. I think the most recent yeah. one that I did was that I played with this was Tinner's Trail had something very similar. Mm. Mm -hmm. where you would take super strong actions, but that means that other people can either take a bunch of little ones. And there's some cool timing aspects with that, Mm -hmm. where you can take a bunch of little ones until it's right about not your turn and then take a big one. So I really like stuff like that, where you can try to do your best to min max your time, which is really Mm -hmm. cool. And there are two, the two biggest actions or the two, what did you say? Big actions? Yeah. Like big time investment actions. Yeah. The two big time investment, you, or you can do this twice. I should say is, um, not survey what was the word basically you are told what exactly is in what sector and you can only do that twice so that really helps solidify you know you have facts for the game that's pretty cool yeah so you're not fully guessing um Mm. so and then again depending on what level of difficulty you i think still only get to do two in the advanced version so it's just there's definitely there's definitely a lot of elements and again, the intuition problem solving uh, deduction game. It, I think it was really neat. Nice. Is this one that you would go back to? Is this one that you own or that you played from a friend? Uh, played from my siblings okay. um, who live like 15 minutes. We always, they're, they're the ones that we always have like game nights with. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, I would definitely play again. It was, I'm also want to play it again because it was like frustrating because there's definitely ways it's good to bid. Mm-hmm. Um, because that really helps with points. And if you're the first person to bid correctly, you get like an extra point. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, there's again, lots of elements. So I would definitely play it again. Um, and I think I def- if you like deduction games, I would definitely try it out because it is a different flavor and there are some different mechanics. Um, Good to hear. I have a friend who has a copy of this that says they really enjoy it. Yeah. And he's pretty apprehensive about app games. So I'm glad that this works. And if he likes it, then this is definitely one that I'm looking to try soon. Yeah. Cool. So good to hear. Good recommendation from you as well. So that is Search for Planet X. Any other things to talk about on this one, Corinne? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. I think just all the the circular gameplay, the the deduction, everything. It was very, it was very helpful. It was good. Glad to hear. Excellent. So that is the Search for Planet X. Cool. So this brings to my next game. This is one that I have been waiting so long to play more of. Uh, the expansions for it finally have delivered, and oh, I'm so happy with them so far. This is Etherfield. So Etherfield is a dream crawling game. This is where you play as a dreamer, and you're going to be going from situation to situation through these large map tiles. The map tiles are going to have interaction points on them, and then through these interactions, you're trying to solve a specific puzzle for a dream. Now, when you enter, generally you're going to have some vague idea of what you're going to be doing in the stream, you'll discover it as you play through the use of interacting with cards or tiles. I'm not going to do any spoilers here. Anything that I talk about is going to be from the rule books or the expansion rule books. So I'm not going to go into any nitty gritty on the dreams, but I will just say that the new dreams are excellent. They are very cool and the new expansions do not disappoint so far. I'm about, I would say 24, 25 hours into the expansion so far. I've played through I think nine dreams, nine new dreams, and they have not disappointed. I am very happy, happy that this got here. Now, the one thing, though, that I do want to talk about with these new expansions are some changes that they've made. They're seamless changes, and you find this when you open them up right away. And this is also going to be implemented for the second printing of the game. So as mentioned before, you are going to be going on these big dream adventures. And when you do that, you're going to be going to these large tiles. And this is one of my favorite parts of the game is that everything is condensed into a single tile and card pack. So if you're going on an adventure, you pull out a single pack and you play it. And then when you're done, usually you remove it from the game. Now there is, however, a little bit of upkeep in the game that's between the missions. And this is called the the dream world map. So it's think of something like a hub world in an RPG or a 
like a mini, a, a successive mini games that you're going to be playing as you get to the next location. So I'm trying to find a picture of it for you here, but it's basically like a small mini map that you're going to go to that has all of these little icons that you'll visit. Mm -hmm. So with the new edition of the game, they've actually replaced all of the map pieces, all of them, and completely have done a reworking on the way that the symbols work and the slumber system works and everything. And I th didn't really mind the slumber system in the initial version of the game. So I was wondering what they were going to do in order to figure this out. So <laughs> this picture is not what I was looking for. It looks like somebody has used the miniatures from uh, Etherfields in order to upgrade their Architects of the West Kingdom game, which <laughs> looks pretty fantastic if I do say so myself. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay, so I don't think this is going to necessarily show exactly what I'm yeah. trying to show here. But are there, do you keep track kind of like in, I think it's Gloomhaven, where you have like stickers to cover over certain places that you visited, or how is the upkeep, I guess? So, no stickers. It's generally all in the form of cards. You start with okay. a lot of stuff not unlocked, and as you unlock new things, and you can sort of see it in this bottom section here. There's like mm -hmm. a bit of the map. It's in sure. this. There's eight tiles potentially. There's a yeah. room for eight. And then as you get new ones, they'll slide into this large map. So you'll start unlocking more and more. Cool. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore. I'm not going to try to find this picture. But the big thing here is they've replaced the entire map and they've changed the symbols. And I think that the new changes are brilliant. I think that they're seamless and they really will improve the quality of life. They keep the slumber system in, which are kind of mini encounters between your big ones. And they mm -hmm. allow recurring characters to show up from mission to mission. And I think that's really awesome. You're able to also use this time to set up your character. So for example, the mission might say you have three turns to combat this thing, or you have two turns to interact with this immersion that's there. And so during this time, you will still get to draw like you were in a normal mission and you can play these progress cards, you'll get you special abilities, you can rest, interact with the map pieces. And when you're finished, you'll move on to that dream world map and go to your next location. The way that they've changed it though, is they've actually made it so that the slumber cards are no longer on the map. Instead, they've made it so that the so the points where you actually go on your adventures, if you land on one of those, if you don't have enough keys to start an adventure, you participate in a slumber and you gain a key. So normally you were going around this map, there were specific locations where you could get keys, but now they basically combined three different symbols into one. And it makes perfect sense. Um, you are having way less of these slumbers, so you're actually getting to play more of the dreams, but you still have enough to where you're able to set up and actually start and enjoy the dream. And I think it's a really healthy change, and I think it's going to be a great option for players. And in addition to that, they've actually made an option where you can play, I think it's called a hyper sleep or something like that mode, where it's an additional two cards, where if you play with them, you essentially completely skip the slumbers, so you're only playing those big packet dreams. So you can basically basically just focus on these larger puzzles as opposed to interacting with the world of Etherfield itself. So some really healthy changes and I was really, really impressed with them in general. Cool. So I'm, I'm not going to get into any more details here, but I do want to say that I am thrilled with the expansions. Um, if you like Etherfield's expansions are going to be more unique and interesting takes on the dreams. And I think that's excellent. That's exactly what you're looking for if you like a game like this. And there are also going to be some changes to the core mechanisms here. If anybody has started the Heartbeat campaign, I'm just going to leave this up here as a clue as to something that I am really happy about. Uh, it won't make any sense to you if you don't know what, if you haven't started that campaign. So take a look at that pretty cool. So this is uh, base game stuff though, so you're not missing anything. If No spoilers here if you're just looking at this. Um, in my question though, I did have a question, a follow-up question for this. Well, first off, do you have any questions about Etherfields or any anything you want to know about this game? Gosh, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Go into that later. No, it's it looks super awesome and definitely a like campaign mm -hmm. long, like awesome storytelling kind of reminds me of Gloomhaven and uh, Tainted Grail with like the cards, like traveling to each card and like in different interactions and things and collections. So it's, it sounds really cool. Yeah. It's a blast. I'm having a lot of fun. I'm going to give my disclaimer here. If you are playing this game for the first time, I do recommend that you play as either the gambler character or the, ooh, and I don't remember its name, the gambler or the, the dreamer the blue one, whatever the blue one is, the blue or the okay. yellow character. The yellow okay. character allows you to re-roll dice 
And then the dreamer allows you to take your removed from play cards and turn them into a currency of whatever you want. And I think that's pretty dang helpful. It allows you to take more powerful actions and do more turns. And it allows you to do a lot of, the term is burst, where you can just uh, allocate a lot of resources to a specific action if that's what you're looking for. So I really appreciate that that's a thing here. Uh, but yeah, Etherfield is a blast and I am enjoying it in general. So this does bring to my question, though, with Etherfield is what games for you have amazing ways to modify the player experience? In this case, it's the replacement of the initial maps. It's the addition of ways to actually modify your experience if you want to play with that slumber mode, if you don't want to play with it. And I think this game does a lot for that, to make it so that you are having fun with the game no matter which way you want to play it. So, Corinne, are there any games that you've played that have completely changed the experience or have ways to modify it? Again, I'm going to my answer, which was last time, which was Tapestry, because Mm -hmm. it's more of they are consistent. I think, well, who knows? Because my husband just told me like a week ago that they had a new update of like all of their updates for the game. They've been constantly working on sending like uh, a graph of all of the all of the different civilizations and basically making tweets. And this is from like the actual like Stone mm-hmm. Meyer and all that. So they're they're making these game ch- uh, choices and either decreasing the ability for some civilizations while increasing the ability for others as well as i really think that the arts and architecture expansion really added to uh tapestry i think it completed it gave it a like another another good element to the game as well as just adding to that theme of what makes a civilization so i think that they are they're still they're improving their game a lot more with the changes of the civilizations and that kind of rules. But I think the expansion of arts and architecture would be the thing that I think really added to it because there's um, not only different civilizations you can add, but I really liked that they added different um, your civilization maps. Mm-hmm added different uh either like limitations or there is there's one that's instead of it's a nine by nine grid it's like an 11 by nine grid or 11 by 11 grid so just a couple of additional things which just made it a little bit more interesting and those um oh what are they called they're the boards that you can add onto your resources resource tracks oh the innovations yes Mm -hmm. yeah and they just add more um they add more uh, point pointage <laughs> accumulations <laughs> benefits to the more houses that you develop and put in your civilization. Yep. I'm a big fan. I really like that expansion. I think it's a must if you're getting tapestry just yes. in general. Yeah. Uh, for me, the games, it, in addition to Etherfields, but I don't want to dive too much because that was kind of what my talk was here. But some games that I want to bring up here are Spirit Island. I think does a really good job at this. Mm. Um, they start off with just Uh, spirits of different levels and difficulties and i think that's really well done they also have difficulties based on the boards you can flip them over to the thematic side or the non-thematic side you can play with the event deck which will make things more varied and you can also even play with scenarios or adversaries which give the uh, colonists different powers and abilities which i think is amazing and then you also have the ability to play certain scenarios which will up the difficulty and i think one of the coolest things they do is they allow you to scale up the game in whatever fashion you see fit um you have options for you basically have these rows and columns that say you have all of these difficulty levels that you can go up to and i think that's so neat because it's it's very clean in the way that you can modify it Uh, some other games off the top of my head another eric roos game and for science it's a dexterity block building game where you can Mm. add and make it as difficulty as difficult as you want you can definitely tell there's some design experience from spirit island put into that and then of course uh, one of my favorites marvel champions does a really good job when it comes to all the different modular sets the different expert difficulty and standard expert difficulty that you can go with i think that there's some great options for changing things particularly in card based game or games that have lots of different scenarios and options so i think there's a lot of good games out there that have have this idea in mind to make it so that the game can be for everybody. And I love that. I think that's really cool. Uh, Just a great design philosophy, in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. if you are watching and you have any ideas of games that have amazing ways to modify their experience for players, please let me know down in the comments below. But Tapestry and Spirit Island, Marvel Champions, all these games have great ways to do so. Root. Root. Hmm, That's a good choice. 
what any 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 more thoughts on Rune? Uh, just like the newest expansions that came out with like yes. some new civil, uh, not civilizations, factions. I think yes, new factions, love, and the hirelings, good yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah, just added elements to the game. It's so good. The oh, I, I could talk about the hirelings all day. We just played a game recently, and they really work as a really good catch up mechanism. It was awesome. It made the game super tense. Everybody was within a turn of winning, and then the, yeah. the switch of control was really cool. I really yeah. enjoy that. That's literally what our last game was like, where mm -hmm. it, the pointage was so close. Yes. Oh, and we played a game. Go ahead. Started go ahead. like sorry. It was just like it started with like someone was like really taking the lead, and all of a sudden someone came like from the from behind and was just like oh, right up to the close. And we're like, oh no, who's gonna win? It was awesome. Oh, it's so good. There's there's some great stuff in there. Um, we had a game where we played with the oh, who is it? The Woodland Alliance. We played mm -hmm. with the cats, and then we played mm -hmm. with the who's the newest character, the Berserker Mouse. So those are our three I factions that were playing. So much. And it was such a tense game. Yeah. We played on the river map. So one of the locations was Black Market and the other one was the pond. But the factions that we had, we had one that were the minor moles that would just pop up out of nowhere and just deal big damage to some big control points. And then we also had the the porcupines, I believe. And they basically Ooh. were just super annoying when it came to protecting the other <laughs> um, the other yeah. faction events. So really enjoy this one. I think the hirelings are a must, particularly in low player count games, but I just think they're super fun and thematic in general. If you've played Root at least once, I would throw mm -hmm. them in no matter what. That's awesome. Oh, they're so good. And we have some comments here. We got Michael here. Thanks for joining mm -hmm. us in the chat. Got to play Wonderland's War and Dice Throne. Really like them both. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you enjoyed them. I'm a big fan of Wonderland's War. So happy that you were able to enjoy it too. Have you played either of these games, Corinne? I have not. I know that Dice Throne was recommended last week for talking about like my my love of Yahtzee. And oh, yeah, yeah, games. yeah. So I'm very excited to hear that Dice Throne has like another positive review. So I definitely want to check out both. So that's awesome. If you were to check out Dice Throne, would you get the generic set, like the fantasy world that they've created, or would you get the Marvel one? Which one are you more interested in? Oh, that's so hard because I <laughs> love fantasy and I love Marvel. I don't know. Both. No. <laughs> My husband would not approve. He would be like, why? Why do you need both? <laughs> yeah, I have to decide. Mm. All right. So this brings us to our next game. Corinne, what are we talking about? Our last game for this episode from you. This game we are talking about Meadow. Yeah. Which is another like just pretty little woodland creature. Uh, it's a tableau building game. And it has, I, it was stunning to learn that each card is different artwork, which is it's just crazy because there's a lot of cards and it's beautiful artwork. Um, you are matching up, uh, you have 10 you can have 10 ground pieces, ground mm -hmm. cards, and then you are building certain cards on top of whatever type of ground that it was required, as well as you are stacking up creatures and different elements as so, and the, and the, what is it? That's like the take, taking turns. The way that they do that is very interesting. You have four basically looking like, uh, like wooden signs or like a picket fence, like a piece of a picket fence. And you can either choose to go onto your main, I would say the central tableau, which has a selection of, I think it's four by four grid of cards that you can choose from. And each number indicates, so you have one through four and the number indicates what card you're going for in that row. So if you're choosing one, you're choosing the card that's right next to you, number one. If you're choosing two, it's the card two cards in. Depending on what size you're coming from, too, you can go on the right or the left side or the bottom. So there's a lot of different ways that you can basically target the card that you want, or you can go onto that central spot that looks like a campfire, and you can do the bottom action on your picket fence, which you can take a card from anywhere on that grid you can get two road tokens which road tokens help you create landscapes which is another added bit to your tableau which is very cool and those usually are worth a little bit more points and you could also there's like a couple more things that you could do in the bottom action so each picket fence has like a top and bottom action and depending on which board that you go to will determine if you're doing a top or bottom action. So there's already a lot of different turn 
types where it's not too overwhelming though. And the other element to that circular board is you see those little circle numbers, um, depending on the symbols that are around the campfire, you, if you have a pair of cards that have corresponding symbols on them, uh, on your tableau, you can put your circle that's based on the color that you're playing, and that will give you extra points. And you start with your lowest point, and you can do that up to three times. So you get two points, three points, four points, depending on if you have those certain symbols and like a pair that is shown on your tableau. Because the other thing about your tableau is that you're going to be covering your cards a lot by um, because you have to like stack it on top of whatever cards you need to create, like to play another card down, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of iconography along with the, the symbols that you need to make certain cards as well as the ground uh, symbols, but it's very easy to pick up. It's not too overwhelming in the sense of the iconography and everything. So and it's a pretty simple point system. You're just, the more cards you play, the more points you get, the more cards you have and the different symbols you have, the more car different types of cards you can play. And so it's just, it was a very fun uh, game to pick up. I've only played it once. So I'm hoping that I'm explaining it right. right. But uh, yeah, it was, it was really fun. And there was definitely a lot of a learning curve but it wasn't hard like I said it wasn't a big learning curve pretty simple to pick up um, artwork beautiful uh, just a really nice very nice game I'd have to agree with you I think the aesthetic is honestly the biggest thing that I really like about this game uh, we actually just recently got this one into our library Yay. it'll show up on our games that enter the library and I have to agree with you I think this one is extremely easy to pick up once you start playing you just go mm -hmm. and then the game's over and you're like what? I need yeah. like a couple more turns. I was wanting to play this card. I but know. It, oh, it's good stuff. I really like the way that you draft your initial hand in this game. There's this big board that has all these cards and you're going to choose a single row from that board and add them all to your hand plus like an end game card basically. Mm -hmm, so you have mm -hmm. some direction going off and I really appreciate that. Yes. It gives you all of these choices from the beginning and I love that moment where you have to decide what card you're covering. For mm -hmm. example, if you play a card that has two symbols, you can choose either of the cards with the symbol on it to cover with the card that you're playing and i love that choice because maybe you want to keep a specific symbol for a scoring objective but you need the other symbol for another card in your hand or one that you want to pick up from the center but maybe you can't access this card right now it's awesome i think this game is really fun yeah i i definitely agree there is a lot of uh, variety and ability to kind of change your tactics through the game so it's it's very, it's very good. And again, it's very, it's so pretty and painterly and very calming. So <laughs> if you like, if you like forest creatures and just really pretty artwork. And then again, it's a, a simple enough game, but it's strategic. And I also uh, think it's, I can't think of the word where it's, it, you're not waiting too long for your turn. Downtime is the word. Yeah, downtime. Because you're you're thinking about okay, what am I going next, mm -hmm. and then what if someone's taking a specific card from the tableau that could completely change your tactic because they took the card that you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> All of those things. So yeah, it's definitely a good uh, game. I love the pacing of this game. You're mm -hmm. constantly drawing and it's always draw play if you're taking a card. Mm -hmm. And it's something you always want to do, which is kind of nice yeah. because generally the cards that you want to play are already in your hand. So when you are taking new cards, they become future options usually yeah. or things that you're leading towards down the road, which mm -hmm. I really appreciate because you kind of already know what you want to play on your turn. So it's all about what you're grabbing. So I think it does take a little bit of pressure off you as a player because you are hopefully able to do something. There's also some flexibility with discarding cards as wild symbols, which I really appreciate. And then the pawns are all multi-use too, which I think is really nice. So you have the bonus actions on the bottom if you're looking for a specific symbol and it's just not showing up. So I think it's I think there's a lot of really cool choices in here. It reminds me a lot of some simple action like simple symbol collection games if mm. that makes sense like mm -hmm. i get some splendor vibes when i play this honestly because mm -hmm. i'm constantly getting things in front of me and building up this tableau, yeah, yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. a very different output in the way that you're picking these up yeah that's a great example now what are your thoughts on the secret envelopes have you seen these with the game no. Do you know those exist? No. So in the rules, there are some secret envelopes that you can get. They look like this. 
and the secret envelopes have promo cards in them. And you're only supposed to open these secret envelopes when you've reached or done a specific thing. I think there's one that you open when the first snowfall has hit your area. So you're in Texas, right? So I don't know if you'll ever get to open that envelope. <laughs> or <laughs> No, I'm in, I'm in Virginia. Oh, you're in Virginia. My yeah. bad. For some reason, I was thinking Texas. You're all Go good. Figure. Okay, my bad. So, so who knows? It, Maybe it'll be very I soon. That you get to open chance it. here. If we get snow. So to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So there's some specific conditions that you have to meet to do this. Have you ever engaged in a game system like this before? Not with like, well, the secret envelopes. Yeah. Like with these specific conditions to open them. No, not, not, not that specific. Like where it's like outside of the game, like for snowfall or something like that. Cause uh -huh. I can only think of like Gloomhaven or like the campaign mm -hmm. games where it's like, oh, you unlock this after you beat a certain level or, you know, uh, do a certain uh, scenario or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's so funny. There's it's something that I'm actually trying to remember. And I think I do remember it's a game that has something very similar. It's called, we didn't play test this legacies. If you've ever heard of this game, it <laughs> is, hilarious. I should probably rate it. Um, I think I'm going to rate it. Actually, I might rate this pretty high. Um, I'll put a six. Okay. We'll play. in wow. the movie. Cause this game is pretty fun. Um, particularly the legacy version. The legacy version has you writing on cards, obviously, and you're mm -hmm. just trying to win. There's like cards that just have ways to win. And I think mm -hmm. the writing component is really well done in this. The game itself, though, has a bunch of these little envelopes where you have to satisfy specific conditions. One of the conditions is like hold a cat or pet a cat or see a wild animal or something like that. So I remember there was a day where we wanted to unlock all the stuff for this and my friends and i we basically went around the neighborhood trying to figure out how to unlock these specific things we knocked on random people's doors in order to hold their cats and stuff oh like it gosh. was it was wild scavenger uh, hunt basically basically the game had a scavenger hunt so i, I really thought it was quite fun but oh, now the yeah, future yeah. me here with the meadow cards in particular i totally just opened all those and just yeah. started to slave them and put them totally. in the game that's uh, hilarious. Uh, yeah, I won't spoil any of those, but um, sure. that's what we did. We just put them all in the boxes because awesome. I was excited for the additional content for the game. Yeah. Do you want to play in a scavenger hunt? Don't open the envelopes. Don't care. <laughs> open the envelopes. <laughs> but I'm glad that you got a chance to play this. Any other yeah. thoughts on Meadow? I think someone had recommended to me in an aesthetically pleasing game. Oh, and yeah. It was absolutely, absolutely correct. So I just uh, again I'm, I'm so shocked that each card is different artwork it's beautiful i think that they did such a good job the art really pulls you in yeah. as you play and you're developing this tableau in front of you that just looks fantastic you have Ugh. all these critters and i really mm -hmm. like the idea that you are looking around this area that you mm -hmm. live in i think that's a really cool theme yeah yeah we actually just got in a bunch of promos for this game today. There's like a Bigfoot promo, an extra envelope that you can put in for the game. So we'll see it. They, they're they one card, so you're probably not going to see it every so often. But yeah. I guess at the rate at which you draw cards and based on the player count, who knows? Maybe it'll show up every so often. True, true. Super fun. Any other closing thoughts on Meadow? Okay. So that is Meadow Corinne's third game for today. And this brings me to my last game. This is a game that I was very much on the fence about. And I did not back the Kickstarter because I did, was not that interested at the time. Um, however, I did find a really good deal on it for a Kickstarter edition. So I decided to give it a try. And this is a game that features two distinct asymmetric roles. And your goal is to, if you are one of the roles, your goal is to kill the other person or digest them. And then the other person's goal is to harvest minerals from the other person's stomach. And the theme of the game is in the title, So You've Been Eaten. So So You've Been Eaten is a game where you play as one of two roles. You're either a miner who has suddenly been swallowed by this giant creature. And your company says, hey, 
excellent. Go inside, get these minerals we need, and then get on out. And so your goal is to collect 10 or 8 minerals, something like that. And the other role is you can be the beast. And you play as basically its stomach and all of the different antibodies and viruses, etc., that are inside of the stomach. Trying to make it as hazardous as you can for the other player. So there's two distinct roles that you're playing as, and the game comes with ways that you can play solo modes on both sides. So you have lots of options when it comes to how you want to approach the game. You can play in the two-player setting, you can play solo on either side. So right now, I've only played the solo modes of this game, so I cannot speak to the multiplayer, but I was very excited to have two distinct solo modes. However, I hate to report that one of the solo modes is pretty fun, and the other one... Not so good. So mm. this one has, um, the one that I really enjoy is the miner. So the miner here has the ability to jump into the stomach and you're going to be manipulating the different pieces. So you'll have this dice tray that you'll roll some things out of these action dice and you'll allocate those action dice into this board in front of you. So the board has a variety of different spots that are going to allow you to manipulate these things that make up the chest. So let's take a look here. For example, if you put the dice in this middle section here, you're allowed to destroy some of the cards that are in the stomach. If you put them on the right side, you're able to take the actual gems that are in the stomach and collect those. Those are basically your victory points. And then the left side allows you to manipulate the stuff in the center. So you're trying to use your dice effectively to push things around and gain as many victory points as possible while not being digested. And the when the beast goes, the beast is going to have the ability to manipulate potentially the cards in front of them, add cards from their hand to the center in order to determine what the options that the other character has. And then they'll also be able to use these symbols that they've collected in order to by special abilities for themselves. And these special abilities will have, maybe allow them to win through a specific route a little bit faster than other routes. It might inflict some damage to the miner and some roadblocks, just things to make things generally more difficult. Mm -hmm. And every turn you have the opportunity to buy these cards. So the more that you get out, the more pressure is put on the miner. So the miner wins if they collect all of the gems. The beast wins if they're able to kill the miner through these antibodies, or if they're able to put out five of these special ability cards. And so the miner itself is pretty fun. I really like the idea of the action dice system. You're always wanting to be as efficient as possible, collecting as many gems, because sometimes if those gems are there, they might disappear if you don't get them that turn. And there are mm -hmm. only two gems in the entire deck. So if you don't get one of those gems, um, you're basically going to have to run the clock. And then at the end of the game, if you do run the clock, you will compare your victory points to the enemy victory points. And that's based on how much, how many of the antibodies they've been able to get. Never gotten that far. I've been able to manage it, but um, I think that's pretty cool. That pressure is there. But then on top of that, you're also managing those special ability cards, the different germs that can potentially attack you. And then you also have this form of upgrades that you can give to yourself with your action dice as well. So I like the choices that are present with the miner. However, when you're playing as the beast, I find it not very fun at all, honestly. You have this hand of cards and you have a very loose resource system where you are able to gain energy. And the energy is based on the number of crystal cards that you're playing. So in order to get more abilities, you have to give more opportunities to the miner. And I don't think this choice is as exciting as the dice placement actions in the miner. It's also a lot faster. There's way less options and way less choices that you can get. And I think that it's, it's honestly just not as satisfying. So it is a little unfortunate. The other thing that I think that the solo mode for the beast does poorly is that it takes way shorter than the miner's turn. So when you're playing as the miner, you are using your dice, you're moving things around, you're interacting with this board. But if you're playing as the beast, you're doing a lot of the upkeep for the miner to replicate it as another player. And honestly, this is a situation where the solo mode AI is taking way longer on its turns than you actually are. And for me, that's not something I really like in a solo game. I like it when the AIs are pretty quick and snappy, but in this case, it was something that really disappointed me. However, if you, I do really like that minor role, and I'm curious how it would be if you were playing minor versus alien. So the next time I play this, I really want to play as the beast versus the minor itself. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts currently on it. I do really like the solo mode as the minor, but the beast is one that I probably won't play solo again, unfortunately. Any thoughts on this game, on the theme, on the idea? What do you think, Corinne? I think the theme is hilarious. <laughs> Especially that the the company was like, yeah, 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 this is great. Go in there, collect minerals, then come out. We're not worried about your safety. We need the, we need the, 
the bits. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm. That's sad that that both. You know, it's not. I guess equal on the dynamics of both solo plays. Mm -hmm. um, so that's hard to deal with. And I'm assuming that it's just up to a two player game. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, but the art world looks fun. And again, mm. the concept's pretty, pretty fun. Um, yeah. So just other than the, the dynamic of the solo, I, I mean, it definitely seems like a, a game to at least try. And that's what I would definitely say is give it a try. I think it'll be a solo puzzle that is fun to play every so mm -hmm. often. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Honestly, it's been a little bit overshadowed by Mythic Mischief recently for like mm. something in that abstract space. And so sure. I've been pulling Mythic Mischief out more than I've been playing So You've Been Eaten. Yeah. But I am curious to see how this plays at two player, to see that asymmetric work. Uh, yeah. I want to try the beast in the asymmetric player comp because I do think the experience of the minor will be the same. So, mm. which I appreciate. I like that they were able to replicate the the use of the minor in that solo mode. So I think that's yeah. really awesome. Very cool. Yeah, the arts Quan Chi Moria, they did a good job with that in general. And I'm pretty impressed with the deluxe production. The only nitpick I have the entire deluxe production is that the dice tower does not fit in the box. And that is a sin because they've ah. made the box bigger in order to, I, I don't know why it wasn't big enough to hold the actual extra upgraded components, huh. which is super frustrating. Yeah. So pretty annoying. You either are going to have wood lift on the box and then it could potentially get squished a little bit. It is pretty durable, so probably not. Um, I don't mind lid lift that much, but it is kind of annoying because there's some wasted space there as well. So yeah. unfortunate. I was going to say, I like that there's like a, a dice dice tower and like mm -hmm. wingspan, but that stinks that it doesn't fit. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty <laughs> annoying. <laughs> But overall, I um, was happy that I did get to try this one. I do think I'll come back to that um, solo minor mode. And we got Emily in the chat here. Good to see you, Emily. I'm very interested in this game. I hope that you enjoy it. Cool. Um, definitely give it the minor a try. I think that'll be the solo mode to go to. And let me know if you play the competitive version playing as the beast. I'd really like to hear how that plays. Sweet. So that is So You've Been Eaten. Unfortunately, a little overshadowed by Mythic Mischief, but still one that I think is fun to check out, particularly as the minor. And that brings us to the end of our episode here. We'll quickly go through all of the games that we've been playing. Corinne, do you want to start off with the unique games that you've played? Absolutely, because I only have four. Okay. <laughs> Which is Planet X, Search for Planet X, Night Cage, Meadow, and Quartz. Quartz? What's that? Have you... On my aesthetically pleasing video, I talk about Quartz. So Quartz is no longer actually a game in production. It was overtaken by Disney. Huh. Um, it's which it's now like Snow White and Seven Dwarves mining. But anyway, so it's a card and um you reach in a bag and you are mining gems. Mm -hmm. And so each time each gem color is worth different points. <gasps> if you get two obsidian. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I've played this game. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Yeah. So Fine. it's yeah, it's no longer in production because uh it was the or or I guess I don't know, the rights, the the theme, the something. The theme. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, the theme. But yeah, it just was now there's like a Disney Does Disney own dwarfs? I don't I don't know. Yeah, but they it's, own seven of them, I guess. True. Yeah, but no, but I love the artwork and everything about this game. It was super fun. One of the first games I played with my now husband when oh, we were dating. Yeah. How fun. Yeah, I've actually yeah. played this one. This one was actually yes. pretty fun. I enjoyed this yeah, one. Yeah, tactile, mm -hmm. luck of the draw, but you can also use cards to give you advantage on what gems you pull out, mm -hmm. as well as you have reaction cards to if someone's trying to steal a gem from you. So yeah, there's definitely a fun dynamic to that game. Sweet. So that's Quartz. If you haven't heard that one, go check it out. Awesome. All right. So I have 26 unique titles for these last two weeks. Marvel Champions, Mythic Mischief, So You've Been Eaten, Strike, Meadow, Blood on the Clock Tower, Clever Cube, Corrosion, Viscounts of the West Kingdom, Riverside, Dune Imperium, My Father's Work, Wonderland's War, Marvel Legendary, King Domino Origins, Unmatched, Lorenzo Il Magnifico, Crokinole, Cat in the Box, Deluxe Edition, Concept, Cockroach Poker, Ink and Gold, Etherfields, Arkham Horror, The Card Game, Viticulture World, and Rift Force. So busy week, but having a good time in general. Got to play some excellent games. Some hits, some misses on the new games I've tried. But overall, pretty pleased with this month. I've had a pretty good, pretty pleased with the last two weeks, I should say. Pretty good games. Sweets. 
<laughs> Excellent. All right. Anything else that you want to add before we close up the stream today, Corinne? Mm -mm. Okay, cool. And once again, if you have any suggestions of games that we should be looking at for the future or any comments about any of the games that we talked about here, please let us know down in the comments for this video. So whether you're watching live, we really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Michael and Emily, for being here. And if you're watching later, still, thank you so much for watching and for engaging in our discussion and any of the questions that I talked about here. Sweet. Anything else, Corinne? Yeah, thanks again so much for watching. As always, Mackenzie, thank you so much for letting me come on and just talk to you about board games. This has been a blast. Thank you again, Corinne. And thank you so much for watching. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help our channel grow. And if you haven't already, please go check out Corinne's channel. There's a link in the description of the video where you can find all of her definite, cool, different perspectives on all facets of nerddom. Yes. Sweet. So we'll go ahead and close it out. Side game strong, y'all. Have a great rest of your day.